Okay, welcome to Tree of Life Ministries. We appreciate you being here today. We're going to continue our teaching on this, the uh, spiritual code and symbology of the words that Jesus spoke. Hi, Glenda. Hello, Frank. Butch, how are you? Uh, I started last week, I guess, uh, teaching on uh, what Jesus said. All through Scripture, you see places where it said Jesus said or Jesus answered. So it's important for us to understand what he did say and what it really means and kind of dig through it and look under the surface and see how that can apply to us today. As we've learned, uh, the Bible's not always, the people that uh, spoke in the Bible, the Old Testament, whatever, weren't always speaking to us, but they were for us. The Apostle Paul said that everything that the children of Israel went through or did were in samples, which means examples to us. So. We need to understand what the example, example means to us. We need to understand what Jesus said means to us. And last week, if you missed out, I, I think I would encourage you to go back and watch it. Uh, of course, it's on my Facebook page. I'll probably upload them to YouTube tonight. But uh, we learned a lot of really awesome things. One thing that stuck out to me the most is that the word Christ really means contact and how important for us to stay, it is for us to stay in contact with our Father. And I'm going to use a little bit of that today. But today I want to talk about living by the faith of Father, revealed by Jesus, living in full confidence. And actually, the word faith means confidence. And, uh, you know, I when I was sitting down to prepare for today, I wasn't quite sure which direction I was going to go. And so I just sat there in silence for probably five minutes waiting for Father to direct me. And then I heard faith. And so I looked up where Jesus talked about people's faith and what faith did to them or what confidence did for them. So uh, I wrote in my notes here, have you ever wondered when the Apostle Paul, where he got this phrase, the just shall live by faith? Because we all quote that all the time. I do, because I believe that when, the, when uh, the, uh, Luther, Martin Luther was translating scripture, he was translating the book of Romans, and he saw where scripture said the just shall live by faith, and that literally changed his life. It, he began to wonder why the re religion uh, taught us to do do things to please God and so I always thought that's the first place that said that but when I looked it up last night it's not it was in Habakkuk too and that's where it was it's the only place in the Old Testament that the where it talked about living by faith so he also used that same phrase when he talked to the uh, com community believers at Galatia and uh, the Hebrews and he was real, uh, very familiar with the writings of uh, Habakkuk. He was a, a doctor of the Old Testament, if you would. And so he knew where that phrase came from in chapter 2, verse 4 of, of Habakkuk. And, it, you know, I paraphrase it because uh, a lot of times when you see behold or whatever, it literally means stop, look, and listen. It's like when we were younger and you went with, to a railroad track, there was a uh, X on that railroad, tra a railroad track, and it actually said stop look and listen and that was to protect you so Habakkuk said to the people he was talking to or prophesying to him at that time he said stop look and listen a son or a daughter of God which stays in contact with the God consciousness does not upright him or herself on their own but they live upright by faith or they live upright by confidence which is being established or built up in our central which is our God or our central God ruling mind you know, so the truth is we are already redeemed. We are already holy. We, are, we, we never lost that position with Father. Mankind never did. And so literally we can continue to live in that upright faith by staying in contact with our source. It's that easy. It really is. And we've made it so hard. People are always trying to find the right person that can tell them how to live, how to live free from something or whatever. But we just practice staying in contact. And how you do that is... You know, if I wanted to stay in contact with one of you, I would call you, I would visit with you, you know, find out about you. And so literally all we need to do is communicate with our Father. And as I believe it was Brad Jerzak, I may be wrong, but he said, we need to do more listening than we do talking. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you go into prayer or conversation, you don't always have to use words because Father speaks to our, to our thoughts. So in Habakkuk 2.4, the King James Version used the English words, the just shall live by faith. And the word faith comes from a Hebrew word, word which is A-M-A-N. 
and it's pronounced amen, and it means to take the right-hand road or turn to the right. And I thought that was interesting because Kay Fairchild has been teaching a lot on the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain, and the right side is the side of spirituality. We could call that the, the mind of God, the mind of Christ. And there's another Hebrew word for uh, that phrase, live by faith, and it's jamin, J-A-M-I-N, pronounced jamin, and that translates right hand or right place also. So literally, if you're going to live in confidence, you need to do so from the right side of your brain or from leaning to the mind of Christ or keeping contact with God. Isn't that cool yes. that that said that? Yes. And so a person who knows their spiritual ability comes from Father and out of them, then we live in abundant supply. We live in fullness. We, we have joy and we have all the good things that our Father provided for us. We have all the inheritance that Father put on this earth for us. And, of course, we've quoted it numerous times, but we have all things that pertain to life, which is physical life, and godliness, which is spiritual life. We lack nothing whatsoever. The only thing we lack is knowledge. You know, the Bible says that people perish for lack of knowledge, not that there is no knowledge, but that thou hast rejected knowledge. So many people today, and have for many, many years, have rejected the knowledge of God. And the reason why is because they've gone after carnal knowledge, and they believe that to be the, a greater truth. And we believe in science. We believe science confirms the Word of God. We believe science and the Word can work together. And, and so, because all things in this earth reveal God, and no science came to being without God. God is science. And we've never been taught that before, but God is science. God is, you know, is what causes the sun to shine, causes the planets to, to uh, stay in their orbit, causes uh, life in every form there is. So God is science. And so we, what we do is we want to receive, ma'am, more, more than that. So we want to consciously receive uh, the engrafted word of God that, uh, with meekness. That means not in all in piety, not uh, all heady about it or whatever. I was talking to Dr. Cecil today and they're sending me uh, my two master's degrees that I've earned through the school. And I was, he was, he was, we were kind of laughing about it. And I said, I'm going to have a very good resume now. And we joked a little bit about it. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I'm not doing it because for people to be impressed with me. I'm doing it to learn. But Paul, after a while, considered all that to be dung. You know, but I don't believe that I'm learning from man whose breath is in his nostrils anymore. I believe that we're learning from people who are spiritually mindful and they're listening to the voice of God. And again, we want to be constantly making contact or staying in contact with the Father. Because, uh, because intimacy is what's important anyway. Yes, it's, intimacy. It's a relationship. Yes. It's a relationship. You can have all the knowledge in the world if you're not intimate with the Lord. You know, it, does, it puffs you up or whatever. But if you're intimate with the Lord, He can give you all the knowledge that you need. Right. And that's what you're doing. You're tapping into the God mind. Right. So we, we don't have to say, okay, I need to go make contact with Father. You know, yes, we need to oftentimes get off by ourselves and meditate and think and listen. You know, just like I did last night when I was preparing for this lesson, I wasn't sure where to go yet. I hadn't heard anything in my dreams or my sleep. So I just sat there and I was quiet. And, uh, you know, I, I heard, well, maybe you shouldn't teach tomorrow. You know, you hear those crazy thoughts. But I just sat there because I knew and I waited. And I calmed myself, and, and then I, I heard a word. And that's because we are always in contact with Father. We can't go get in contact. We are in contact with Father because we are one with the Father and always have been. And so we have to be still. Yes. The Scripture says be still and know. And know, and that's an intimate knowledge like Donna was just saying. Be still and get into your intimacy, and then all things that you require will be revealed to you. And that's one of the meanings of ask. Ask means to ascertain, seek, and desire to know a thing. It doesn't mean to be asked for food or ask for a car or ask for a spouse or all the things that we were taught to ask for because we thought when Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you, he actually said, ascertain and seek and desire to know and that will be revealed to you or it will be added to you. And that's what I did last night, quietly. So Jesus at rest at the right hand are in and out of the right side of his brain, which would be his awareness, came, it, came, it, came from, uh, it helped him overcome temptation to live as carnal or to live 
and the religious mindsets or to live the way the world did. And that pictures the cosmos way of living. If you remember, Jesus said in this world, and when you look that up, it says cosmos. If you're into this cosmos system, you will have tribulation. It's just a fact. If I trust the, the financial industry to be my source, I'm going to have tribulation. If I trust the medical industry to be my source, I'm going to have tribulation. If I tr trust the political industry uh, and that's my source, I'm going to have tribulation. Whatever it is, you will have tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer because I have overcome all of that. And if he overcame it, then we can overcome it. You know, people say, well, we let his overcoming become our overcoming. But what we do is we see how he overcame all that. And then that's what we, we do. We cooperate with that. And he did that by keeping his mind constantly on the father. He depended on his father. His father was his source. Right. And so uh, we, we cannot live as Jesus did because, you know, some people say, well, you can't live as Jesus did because we're still just human or we're still a sinner saved by grace. And I say, not so. You are believing that great lie of separateness. We can live exactly the way Jesus did. Jesus was empowered by Father to come to show us the way, the truth, and the life. Man had forgotten. Man did not continue to believe who they were. As I say, Father God sent messengers to them. Father God sent prophets, anointed prophets, to speak to them. And they still rejected. They still refused. And then finally, God sent a son, a son. To come and teach the truth and that's what Jesus did. So during uh, one of my teaching times on the internet uh, last week by way of Zoom and by, by the way we're going to have another Zoom meeting Friday night at five I mean Thursday night at five o'clock and I'm going to be teaching on uh, simple answers to what seem to be difficult questions and so CISO will be there and Robin will be there and hopefully other people so if you want to be on that Zoom meeting you need to contact me by uh, messenger or by my email at Dr. Roy E. Richmond at Cox.net. Let me know and I'll send a link to you so you can be in that. But during that meeting, uh, I got to meet a wonderful man, a brother by the name of Gary Wisdom. And I love that last name, Wisdom. <laughs> you know, but he asked me to explain certain things. And one of them he asked me to explain was, that, well, you know, he said, knowing these things, then that begs the question about, what, what about the first man, Adam, and the last man, Adam? And so I explained it to him in a, in a way. I didn't have time to look it up. But yesterday, I looked it up last night. And there's only one verse that says that. It's 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 45 is the only verse where it uses last man, first man, Adam, last man, Adam. So uh, the first man, Adam, uh, it says in the King James, was made a living soul. And the last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. So the way the King James Version did that, it made a difference. Like there's a difference in the first man, Adam, and a difference from Jesus. And that's what religiosity has always done is they have dumbed down men to make us think that there were, were less than God and less than Jesus. And I've said that many times. We exalt Jesus a highly above us. Well, I exalt Jesus for who he, who he was and who he is and what he revealed what he was willing to do i exalt jesus for that because no man has ever laid his life down for mankind like like jesus did and so those are english words that were wrongly translated by the religious systems of that day one has to be aware of the context of the scripture that's written you know many times we'll take one verse and make a whole doctrine out of it and people quote that all the time but they never quote about what it said before or what it said after or what Paul was talking about to the Corinthian church. So prior to verse 45, there are many more verses that reveal the context. Paul is explaining the body, the body by using several different examples. And verse 45 is in between two verses explaining that man has always been spiritual, even though they thought they were not. They thought they were naked. They thought they had done something to cause them to lose who they were. They were not. They were eternally, and they were also a life-giving spirit from the very beginning. So the Greek language <clears throat> would translate into English as, In this way, therefore, it is inscribed and caused to be gene-erated, the race of man as the holy breath of God, which is spirit, eternally living as holy breath, world without end, to the uttermost of mankind as holy breath. So literally what Paul was saying is the first race of men is the same as Jesus was. There, there's no difference. 
uh, they were, when you look up living soul, it says breath, and that's Holy Spirit. That's the very breath of God. So they never lost the breath of God. They never lost who they were. They were always world without end. Man will always be spirit. Man will always be in the image of God. Whether they believe it or not, whether they live like it or not, they will always be that. So we do not have to experience any trials or sufferings because we are not of the cosmos. We are of the spirit. We live in the cool of the day. And we are cool of the day people and have been since the very first race of mankind. When I say we, I'm not talking about just us who watch this or just us who know these things or just people who have joined different religions or just Christians. I say we as the entire earth, the whole world, all people always have been. And so what we've been from this first race, Father projected that into visibility by Father to the endless and now people. It will always be that way. And so to live an overcoming life as Jesus exemplified in his life in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, we must spiritualize our five senses. What do I mean by that? Well, our five senses have been basically used to, to uh, sense carnal things, feelings, taste, smell, sight. We've always walked by sight to please, to bring pleasure to us, if you would. And so if we spiritualize our five senses, literally, we do it until material consciousness is raised to spiritual consciousness, where we hear, we smell, we see, we taste, whatever it is, we sense it spiritually and we understand it spiritually. And our senses are given to us to bless the earth, not just to bring pleasure to me individually. And so many times in my years <clears throat> of teaching, excuse me, <clears throat> I have stated the five senses were created for the outflow of the holy breath of the Father, not the inflow of what we get from the, from the physical realm. We are created a God-man, and we are created to bless people. The word cherubim means people of blessing, so we're in this earth to bless people. You know, one of the greatest ways you can bless a person is touch. People today have rejected touch. They, you go to work today and you're not allowed to touch anybody hardly because somebody's offended. But what they don't realize is because, and the reason that's happened is because people have touched more carnally than they have spiritually. A good hug and a good blessing, we all need that. I need hugs. I enjoy hugs. I miss it when during this, during this time of the, what they call the pandemic, I've not been able to touch people and hug people. I don't like that. And there's a system that would love to stop that permanently, I promise you, but it's not going to. And so living as holy breath and the voice of our Father will result in complete mastery of the experience that our bodies already redeemed. Complete mastery in the experience that we have the mind of God. And then we can use our speech to bless people. And instead of sniffing out sin, I used to call people sin sniffers. Instead of sniffing out sin, we sense, if you would, we sense people's holiness and people's righteousness. And everything that we receive from them is who they really are, not what they present themselves to be. And so we want to cease living as mere mortals. We want to cease living with a liable to die mentality and realize that we are immortal, even though it doesn't look like it. We go to graves where I did a funeral the other day and a person died. And so we focus on that. But literally, they died immortal. They were immortal. Uh, there's scripture where, Jesus, where God said that you are princes, but you will die as princes because you don't know who you are. And so we need to understand that. Uh, in that PC Bible program, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but you need to look on my Facebook post, some of the griefs. I found out that my PC Bible program that I use by BibleSoft it's free now. They have a basic basic one, which is really all you need. It has Strong's interlinear. It has Thayer's interlinear and another interlinear in there for Bible study. And all you got to do is download it and learn how to use it. And it's a fabulous tool. But in there, I have the Adam Clark commentary. And I think it may be in this one. He lived from around 1760 to 1832. And he's really one of the only commentaries I go to. Uh, for the most part, he had some real understanding. But he was a British Methodist theologian. He was a Bible scholar. And his commentary about Habakkuk in chapter 2 was, Any man who presumes his safety in life apart from God 
You presume your safety in life. How can I presume my safety in life? Well, I've got millions of dollars in the stock market. I have all kinds of cash, all I need. You know, I have wonderful cars. We, it's just always about I. It's what I have that that gives me safety. It says, he said he's a proud man. And whatever he may profess or think of himself is not upright in him. It's not upright. He further wrote, but he who puts his confidence, which is faith in Father, doing so will experience eternal protection and and, an eternal experience of life. And what did Jesus come for? John 10, 10. He says the thief, which is the law, has has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what the law did. It killed your, 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 your whole awareness of who you are. It destroyed the ability to live, in, to live life, kill, steal, excuse me, and then it destroyed it. It took it away from us. And so Habakkuk, as the other prophets of Israel, were always represented as watchmen. And that's really what we are. We're watchmen. Watchmen constantly. They're there for comfort. They're there for safety. They're there for welfare of the people. And watching also is to receive the divine instruction of the Father. The prophets were not always everyday inspired. You know, they weren't walking around every day prophesying to people. But when there was something going on, there was possible uh, uh, impending doom, there was an enemy coming against them or whatever, then they would go away and they would meditate and they would listen for God to speak to them in their thoughts. And then they would give that out. And yes, some of them mixed it with their their belief system. Some of them said God said this when God didn't say that. And so when they wished to receive that understanding, they retired from society. Sometimes you have to get away from society to hear God's voice. You have to get away from the television. You have to get away from the chaos in the world. You know, all the stuff that's going on in the United States right now, it's just chaos. It's, the, it's, it's creation groaning. It's a lot of immature people out there. And so sometimes, and I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up and resist that. And I'm not, you know, we say resist not evil, but we don't have to let people destroy our property. We don't have to let things, but sometimes to hear God, you've got to withdraw from that. And you've got to be quiet and you've got to hear this voice. And so that's what Habakkuk did. That's what many of the prophets did. They waited on the voice of the Lord to speak in them. You know, I've been to a lot of meetings in the past where they had so-called prophets come and people would just stand in line to get a word from the Lord. And I never liked that. I never understood it. You know, how can I walk up there and just all of a sudden you got a word from the Lord for me and you've never met me, you've never known me, you never waited and listened to God and say, what is it you want to say to Roy? It just starts coming out. And most of the time it's just stuff that's familiar from meeting you or it's just things that everybody wants to hear. There's not a person in the audience, hardly, that a prophet can't get up, a person that says they're a prophet, and say, the Lord has told me that somebody in the audience that their back is hurting. <laughs> well, if you're in a crowd with 60-year-old people and 70-year-old people, that would, it's not easy to do that. But I want somebody, if they're really going to give a prophetic word to me, I want somebody that's set and listen and say, Lord, I sense that Roy needs some help in this area, or Roy needs a sure word. And they've got quiet and they listen and they allow the Father to speak to them. And then when they come and say, I was meditating, I was thinking about you, and I heard this in my thoughts and I want to share it with you, it will bear witness with what I'm thinking. It will bear witness with a need. If it doesn't, then I just put it on a shelf because I don't believe it's from the Father. So Habakkuk in Habakkuk 2.1 said, and will watch and see what he will say unto me. That's what he was talking about. When I go off and I meditate, and when I listen, I'm going to watch and see what he will say unto me. B-I-Y is the Hebrew word for the phrase, say unto me, and it means in me, in my understanding. So literally, he said, I'm going to hear what Father says in my understanding. I'm going to hear what Father says in my thoughts. Father always speaks in our understanding. Father is all understanding. Father is all wisdom. And so when I sit in my office in there, I listen and Father speaks into my understanding. 
and then I can go to this scripture or this verse or I have this book that I remember reading this in or I have this reference whatever I have literally thousands and thousands of pages that I've written since 1988 that I can resource on my computer and father speaks in my understanding understanding said this is what you learned from John Cahill and then I remember oh it was in the 12 tribes of Israel and I find it and it brings great help to me but I had to listen to those thoughts the very thought of God speaking to me so father always speaks if we will just listen and he speaks the most in our solitude and in our meditation that's when you really begin to hear the voice and after a while you don't have to go off and just be quiet and meditate all the time those thoughts will lead you and guide you all through the days of your life I hear father when I'm out shopping I hear father if I'm at a movie sometimes I hear something in a movie sometimes I you know Donna reads a lot of books and she'll hear father in a book and she'll come share it to me and many many times I've used what she read in a message in a sermon to help people and so then if we literally uh, again when we're listening if we have to use words it's okay but sometimes it's better just to listen you know I've, I've gone I've had people call me and ask me to help them with something but they spend up more time talking than listening and so I'm never able to help them with that so my solitude is my office uh, and sometimes my yard sometimes out on a pond fishing I love hearing father in my thoughts and I very seldom do and some and often I very seldom open my mouth to interject if I do I just say thank you and I'm thankful for what father shares to me so what I do is I follow the trail that I'm led to and on that trail I have found a a uh, I have found fountains of living water and I do that for you I do that for my family I do that for other people I was looking yesterday about thoughts or last night about thoughts and you know when I do things like that I like to Google it and I like to see because uh, you can get a lot from Google you can get a lot on the internet but the science of the brain has discovered we have between 50 to 70,000 thoughts per day isn't that amazing Donna mm -hmm. 50 to 70,000 thoughts per day this means between 35 to 48 thoughts per person per minute every minute you have 35 to 48 thoughts so the steady flow of thinking is a thick filter between our thoughts and our feelings and our brains and our heart which is our God mind and of those thoughts 80% are negative and 95% are repetitive thoughts 95% of repetitive thoughts they're thoughts that you have over and over and over and over and many of them are what if many of them are fear thoughts and the Bible says that Father God is not the author of fear, right? I'm paraphrasing it, but that's pretty much what it says. And so it's not hard to understand how important it is to keep our thoughts quiet, to pay attention to what we're thinking. The Apostle Paul said, casting down, which is a present progressive, because it's constantly you have to do that, casting down vain imaginations. And we hear a lot of vain imaginations. Anything that has fear to it, anything that has a sense of need anything that has a sense of lack is fear and it's a vain imagination because we lack nothing at all so it is father who leads us through life if we will let this same mind that was active in jesus be active in us and that's what it meant when it said let the same mind be in you that was in jesus you had to let it and you had to let it be active i have the same mind that jesus had you do too it's the mind of god but we don't always let it be in us because we let the thoughts of the world dominate most of our life so our thoughts our ideas our beliefs and opinions can be 100 percent in full service of the voice of our father it can be sadly as pointed out in that above paragraph there they're dominated by ignorant thoughts and to say a person's ignorant doesn't mean they're a bad person it just means they don't have knowledge of something and so if our thoughts are on the world then those thoughts are going to get into our being and they cause sickness and disease and poverty and paul said all are weak all are sick all die needlessly for not discerning the body not discerning the the the, the who we are and that we are connected with our father and he father is our source for all things father is the source for all knowledge and understanding there was a king of judah his name was jehoiakim 
And his name means whom Jehovah hath set up. And then also Jah, J-A-H, established. Jah established. So he represents that our will under the control of our true nature has the capacity to establish Father God in our conscious awareness. Establish means something that's solid. It's concrete. It's solid. It's not going to be removed. And so a person like this that is under the control of their their perfect nature uh, will be led by God. Every, their steps, the righteous man's steps are ordered by God, not by that which is without. But what happened with this man, the will of this man has the power to accept or reject truth. We're not robots like God forces to, to whatever we want. So even though he had this nature, the problem with Joachim was even though that he had this capacity, he did not live out of his true nature and he did not live out of his true ability. He did not reference, reverence or he did not listen to the voice of the Father and was not receptive to the ways of Father. So he would symbolize in a person who remains in bondage to the old established religious ideas and the rights that persecute man's inner spiritual confidence or inner spiritual discernment. And there are so many today that have tasted the goodness of the Lord but yet they want the old. They want the signs and wonders. They want the excitement. They want to see people functioning what they call the gifts of the Spirit. They want the old. And so they have the ability to be controlled by truth. They have, they have the nature to desire it, but they choose to go the other way. And it causes all kinds of bondage and problems. So our self-will, our self-will will always betray us every time. So we want to be more like Jeremiah. Jeremiah stayed in connection or stayed connected to the voice of the father. Father spoke to him when he was 14 years old and he said, I will put my words in you. He said, don't say that I'm a child. I will guide you. I will lead you. I'm sending you to the nations, which are the minds of men. He said, I want you to pull up, pluck out, you know, like weeding the garden. I've talked about it before. And, and destroy everything that hinders good growth, and then I'm going to use you to plant. And yet, as you read the book of Jeremiah, the prophets continued, the king, I mean the uh, kings and the leaders, they continued to reject the word of the Lord that came through Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah signifies an exalted state of thought, an exalted state of thought that connects us with our divine mind that we share with our Father. And it demands that all our religious or carnal thoughts yield to that divine law of spirit. And that's what we must do is yield to that. We must practice it. Every day we must practice. When we, we need to pay attention to those thousands and thousands of thoughts that we have every day. And if any of them are contrary to the truth, then we cast that down by the truth. You know, when, if I fear I'm not going to have enough, if I hear that thought, then I cast that down by saying no. I have all things. And see, that's what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4. The real recording of it is he got away from the crowd because he hadn't entered into his ministry yet, full ministry yet. He went to, this, to the temple. He didn't go off someplace out in space with a devil. He went to the temple and he sat on top of the temple and he looked out over the world, his world right then, and he saw the kingdoms of the world and he knew that he, could, he was the only one at that time that stayed in his original birth state and he stayed in contact with God. So he was in contact with that source and he could have ruled and reigned over that area. He could have had people coming and bowing down to him and waiting in line to get to them and they already were. That wasn't his desire, but they were because they were bankrupt physically and they needed healings and they knew that he could. But he said, I am not to take over this kingdom. I am to go into the judgment of the world. But I'm here to teach for three and a half years. I'm here to minister for three and a half years. And then I am going to go away, but I'm going to send under other comforter teachers. Right? And then he had to settle that question, am I who God says I am? And he did. He settled it. And right after that, you can read verse after verse after verse. It said he entered back in the spirit because he was doing that as, a, as man. He entered back in the spirit and it said the fame of him was heard all throughout the earth. And you can see all the miraculous supernatural things that he did to help people. But his desire was to heal them of their mistaken identity. That was his desire. 
That's what he wanted. So we need to yield. We need to let this divine law of spirit and life be our life and our source. And the reason we call God Father or Papa, I like the Papa, is because Jah is Father. J-A-H is Father and the source of one's being. Jah, Father, gives us comprehension of truth and it's held in our awareness and forms our thoughts that we can say and stay in constant faith or confidence in our Father God. And that's what we want, to stay in constant faith and constant confidence in our Father. I have confidence that my path is ordered. I have confidence that my future is good. And I, I constantly resist anything from without that would tell me that it's not. Because all that does is produce fear. So how do we abide in who we are as a son or daughter of God? Well, we constantly fix our thoughts of Father and to dwell and to keep our consciousness in contact with the mind of God. Thus, Jesus said, as I was using this chapter, if you stay, which is the word abide, if you stay and rest as I am at rest with Father, and the utterances made by me are in your understanding, you can ascertain and seek and desire to know a thing, and it shall be revealed to you. There's nothing you can't know. There's nothing you can't understand. There's nothing you can't do unless you're not abiding in rest. You've got to be at rest with God. And most people are not at rest with God. Your thoughts need to be at rest with God. I had a brother call me from the other side of the world and he was telling me about some problems he had. I had another brother from, from uh, here in the United States that told me about some problems he's had. And I said, don't try to quit those things because you're trying to please God. That's not rest. That's work. That's not labor. The very fact that that's you... Labor? That's labor. That's laborous works. Okay. It's not rest. It's labor. Excuse me. It's trying, to, it's, it's trying to appease God. It's feeling condemned because you're doing things that don't fit who you really are. The very fact that you want to change from that is good. So just rest and start feeding. Just feed on the truth. And when you feed on the truth and let God be whatever that's given to you, then that will go away. The disease is not the problem you have. The disease is you don't know who you are. And so that's what I'm sharing with these people, and we'll continue to do that. So during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he used the word faith, which is confidence. In Matthew 6.30, he said, Oh, you of little confidence. You know, Donald Trump reminds me of what Jesus went through. Every time Jesus went out to talk, there were Pharisees and Sadducees there to trip him up, kind of like what? Our fake news, our liberal news media, if you would. They're there, they don't care what he's saying. They don't want him to do good. They, they didn't care if Jesus, they, they, did, they were even amazed that Jesus healed people. They wasn't even amazed at the supernatural things that he did. All they wanted to do is trip him up. And every time that he did something, they would, they would question him. They would try to get him to say something else where they could trip him up. And they hollered blasphemy every time. And I had that happen to me not too long ago. A person asked me a question, and I answered it, and literally he screamed blasphemy in my, in my ears. And, and I thought, well, great. So Matthew 6.30. So then two more chapters later, we start reading of him saying to the centurion, who asked for his servant to be healed of paralysis, because the word palsy means paralysis. He was paralyzed, and the feebleness that came from them. Jesus said, uh, I can come heal him. And the centurion said, uh, out of him thinking he was unworthy, he said, no, 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 you don't need to come to my house. He said, just speak the word and my servant will exist healed. And Jesus said, I have, found, I have not found such great faith or confidence in all of Israel. And see, Israel represents those leaders there. He, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't help them because they didn't believe but, you go, but he goes to the people, and the people believe. And the people honor Jesus and respect people, but the leaders never did. So he told him, he said, go your way, and as you have believed, let it be done for you. And it was. And it was always as you have believed, or as you have faith, or because you are in confidence. The word believe, and believe means to put one's confidence 
are in trust in their spiritual and physical well-being, staying in contact with Father. That's, that's how you do it. It's not that I believe, you know, I believe in Jesus and I believe Jesus can heal me and I believe Jesus can do this and I believe. No, it's staying in confident in contact with them, intimacy with them, yes. what I would say. Yes. So the centurion was making a withdrawal from the one. And Jesus, who stayed in contact with the Father, is God mind that centurion made a withdrawal. And then in Matthew 9, 12, we find the people brought another man who was paralyzed it said sick of the palsy, that's paralyzed. And seeing their confidence, their faith, he said, of course, be of good cheer, your symptoms I drive away. That's what it said when he said, I forgive you. Literally, when it, the word forgive means to drive away. So these diseases that they had, I mean, these symptoms that they had, paralysis, mental illness, he said, I drive them away. Anytime he said, I forgive you, he said, I drive that away. So, of course, there were religious-minded scribes there following him to entrap him. And every word he said, and at that time, uh, this man, he, they said, this man blasphemes. And Jesus well, said, well, uh, he said, he gave them a sign because they wanted a sign that he had the power to do this. And he said, uh, away with the symptom, pretty much. He wanted to heal the mistaken identity, but they, they, they wasn't ready for that. But he, he drove the symptom away, and he, the paralyzed man collected his faculties, and he said, take up your bed and walk, and he did. He obeyed. He listened. And it was that simple. And, you know, here we are, over 2,020 years away from Jesus' earth walk, and we're still care, scared to death to go say, I drive this away from you. It doesn't belong to you. And yet we have the power to do that. So what happened with these people is they heard of Jesus' supernatural works or saw others receiving healing and that repeated affirmation, those repeated testimonies that came to them built up their faith to the point that they could make a withdrawal and they trusted Jesus' words. They put their physical well-being in a trust of the spoken word and the living word. The word faith, which means confidence, it's mentioned 247 times in Scripture. And I could write many more scriptures. I could teach many more scriptures in this book I'm writing about that. But I just love where Jesus said, your faith, your confidence has made you whole. If we could just walk in the confidence of our Father, we can experience our wholeness. He said, your faith has saved you. And the word saved means rescued. So your faith has rescued you from these symptoms that you're struggling with. And we find that in the book of Acts. And in the epistles, faith is used over and over and over. Yes. Confidence. It really means confidence. So the power of our true mind, our holy breath, to reproduce thought is unlimited in expression. We can reproduce upright thought. We can reproduce thoughts that's uplifting and edifying. This ability of our God mind makes thing makes substance out of our ideas it makes substance out of our desires it is called confidence but if we're putting our confidence in our carnal thoughts which what did i say 80 percent of them are negative 95 percent we reproduce that we we release that we bring that down into existence in our life and we're the ones that cause it not god it's consequences of what we dwell on all the time you know, no man, I don't believe a man just wakes up one day and he's a rapist. I believe he's meditated on it. I believe he's viewed pornography. I believe he's formed his thoughts on that to the point that it took over him and that he did something that doesn't fit his nature. Whatever it is, it came from constant thought on the wrong things and dwelling on the wrong things. Right. So when our consciousness or our conscious awareness responds to the call of the voice of the Spirit to come up hither and taste and see, that which seems to be invisible becomes visible. That which, you know, the invisible things of God. We think there's things that, that we can't experience. There's things that we can't do. Well, what seems to be invisible to us today? How about a redeemed body? How about living in a world filled with peace and love and joy? That seems to be invisible. It seems, and we put it off in the future in the sweet by and by. 
I think of that often. All around me is what we think is invisible. Health seems to be invisible to us. Perfection of life seems to be invisible to us. Perfect peace seems to be invisible. Perfect rest and much more seems to be invisible. But we want to bring our confidence into our Father and into our manifestation and then that produces what seems to be visible and it brings it into the visible to the point that you see it because first of all you have to believe it because you can't see something until you believe it. I was talking to Sandra Garner yesterday and we were talking about I was I, I sent her a picture of my ordination from Brother Garner and I, I was remind I was looking at it yesterday and and I've had other ordinations before that but I told her I said this is the one I value the most and I do. I value my relationship with Gary Garner and what he taught me and our friendship. And then she looked at it. She said, oh, my gosh, that's 20 years ago. We were a lot younger then. And I told her she was still beautiful. And she said, well, I don't I don't feel like I am. And I said, well, the truth is when you look in the mirror, because she said, when I look in the mirror, I don't like what I see. And I said, when you look in the mirror, you only see what your brain lets you see. You only see what your thoughts let you see. And I told her, I said, when I see you on Facebook, I always think she's still beautiful. She's still pretty. And so we need this confidence to change our thoughts because our thoughts speak Ill, Ill, evil of us. We're literally the accuser of the brethren is the brethren. We are our own accuser. We accuse ourselves all the time. We say, I can't. I'm not able. I'm no good. I can't talk in front of people. The list goes on and on and on. But that's a lie. So the first step in spiritual development is the awakening, uh, awakening of our confidence and the power of the realms that we think to be invisible. We need to awaken our conscious awareness that we are the redeemed of the Lord. We were redeemed from the foundation of the world. We were born redeemed in every sense of that word. We are whole. This body has a, the full ability to keep itself healed and well. The cells can be reproduced properly. Everything can be. And so we gradually, what we do, we do that through faithfully listening to the voice of our Father with intelligence. We can hear that through people like me. I'm ministering. You can faithfully listen with intelligence and pay attention. We gradually develop constant contact with the, the supernatural mind, which is our God mind. And then various ways we experience daily the guidance of our thoughts and it becomes a norm it becomes something they're used to you wake up in the morning listening to the voice of God and the thoughts you dwell in the cool of the day you know I was listening to one of the professors at the school and they were talking about how God came to Adam and God came looking for Adam no I don't believe that I believe God was with them 24 7 because they were one Spirit, there's no distance in spirit. God didn't go somewhere and then come visit Adam. Adam tried to hide from God, but you can't hide from God because you are the very embodiment of God. Right. But he tried to because he didn't know who he was. That's separation. That's separation. I mean. And so what we, we need to do is practice daily being guided by the Father, listening to the Father. And I don't mean you have to do so crazy as to go to the grocery store and say, Father, should I get this brand of green beans or that brand of green beans? I, I'm talking about being guided in our life. Here, this is the way walk you in it. Here are the thoughts that come to you that, that reveal more and more the truth of the word. The list can go on and on. And the early growth is not deeply rooted very quickly, though it takes time. If you have been used to listening to the thoughts of the outer world, it takes time to shut those voices down and realize that they're hurting you and they're hindering you. Just like Abraham, he lived in a tent for a while. He, 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 he illust that illustrates that confidence has not yet become an abiding, abiding quality, if you would, uh, in, their, in his consciousness. But the more we practice keeping our thoughts or keeping our minds stayed on the God mind, focus on the voice, then that confidence takes a firmer and firmer a hold. Like me in the sales industry, I didn't become a super salesperson all at once. I became a master salesperson. And, but it took from 1973 when I first began to sell. Actually, I worked in the retail business for years, but the first thing I ever sold was exterminating, orchid exterminating. And then I... And Brahms ice cream. And then 
I, I went into the furniture industry for 20 years and I went to every positive mental attitude a seminar there was. I read every kind of, it, it took a, pro, a progression of time and I learned and I learned and learned until I became the master and I began to teach. And I traveled the country teaching. But that took time. It wasn't just overnight. So the same thing with us today. Keeping our thoughts stayed on the mind of God takes time. It just, yeah. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to do it today. Because if you do it that way, you're going to mess up tomorrow. And then you begin to condemn yourself. But if you do, it's okay. You know, uh, John Cahill said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, yeah, I messed up, but I'm still the redeemed of the Lord. I'm still, I, but I keep going and it's it's from glory to glory which is appearing to appearing from revelation to revelation you're changed into who you really are you're changed into the likeness of god that you really are and your mind begins to stay on god and your thoughts become fifty thousand or whatever i said a day become thoughts of good and not thoughts of bad right yeah. so uh what we want is the immersion of our conscious awareness that will make us free of the falsely believed limitations of the dust realm. We have agreed that we're limited and we are not limited. Our single eye begins to open to the new Jerusalem environment, the dwelling place all around us. It's here already. And so Paul was explaining the condition of people in the foundation of the world, at the foundation of the world in Romans 1.20. And I'm going to close here pretty soon. But... Uh, he said, for the invisible things, this is the King James Version, for the invisible things of Father from the creation of the world are clearly seen. See, when man, the race of man was first created, they saw everything that we thought was invisible. They saw God in their awareness, in their consciousness. They experienced God. They felt God. And so, for the invisible things of Father from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, man could understand it, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without excuse. So he's talking about what they did from the foundation. They had no excuse to, to lower themselves into the dust realm. My translation of verse 20 is, they could indeed gaze at the Father and all that is, and were capable of clearly discerning the experience and Father in themselves. They had the ability from the foundation of the world, as did all the world's inhabitants. They clearly observed the workmanship of his hands. They experienced him in his full everlasting self as one mind, one body, one spirit, and one power. Father fully revealed to them his character as Father created. They were without excuse. So what seems invisible to us, and is not, is Father God is in us as us, our holy breath in us. Another truth that seems invisible to us again is our redeemed body, including our redeemed brain, and we living in or as the isness of Father. Whether we ever see these visible realities or not, they are visible and they are existent right now. Right now. We're not looking for this to come to pass that's our problem. If we're still looking for something, then hope deferred makes the soul sick. And there's a lot of sick people out there because they have always put things off into the future and then they put a date to it. And when that date comes and it doesn't happen, they get sick. All are weak, all are sick, all die easy for not discerning the body. We're always looking for a body out there to come down and do something for us. So the people at the foundation lost their confidence in what Father said. They, they either rejected or they didn't hear with intelligence what Father said because they yielded to the devil of religiosity repeatedly over and over and over and they were taught the knowledge of good and evil. They leaned their attention to those lower realm understandings and still today people are doing the same thing. We, we sat in a church that I love very much for 38 years my first 10 years was a very even more religious organization that kind of shaped my life at that time. But for 38 years, I heard the same thing over and over and over. And it was just seeded and concreted into my awareness. And I literally, it was difficult to get it out of me. Even hearing Brother Garner teach, he taught penal substitution. It was better than what I'd heard before, but it was still cemented in me. And I became... 
an expert at teaching no penal substitution. I understand Paul understood Paul's system of truth, truth backwards and forwards, and it takes time to get that out of there. And so we, we do that. So they did this. So Paul continues explaining what the people did at the foundation in verse 21 on, and I'm going to read that to you, and this is my translation. I'm going to go through uh, verse 26. Therefore, when they absolutely knew Father, they did not esteem him as the one and only Father. They did not ascertain, which means discover, or seek and desire to know him. Neither did they express gratitude to him, but they became foolish and worshipped false idols in their imaginations concerning themselves. They became blind and lost their conscious understanding of the truth about their true nature. Verse 22, sharing their thoughts as though they were wise, they became insipid, dull, wishy-washy, characterless, and foolish. Verse 23, and in their false perception, in their imagination, they made the goodness, the nature, the character, and the love of our eternal Father different than it was. In other words, they made lots of false gods. They made Father like unto their image of what they believed themselves to be, a perishable, hewn-down man in the same category as birds, earthbound beasts, and reptiles. Verse 24, wherefore they gave up the true reality father, their creator, through being mindful of their conscious awareness of being morally impure, because of embracing this false misconception and their inner being, they willingly dishonored their bodies. They willfully exchanged the truth of one loving father into a falsehood. They ascertained, sought, and desired to know father's creation instead of father, and rendered homage to that which father created worshiping themselves and all things created more than our father creator who is to be spoken of well uh, spoken well of for eternity so be it and then verse 26 it says from that act of of, of above of those who lived at the foundation of the world themselves gave father up for their conspicuous desires gave up father for their conspicuous desires when you look in the king james it says father gave them up but when you look in the greek it, they reversed the sentence and it said they gave father up for their conspicuous desires. So let us not do that. For their what? Conspi desires? Conspicuous desires, carnal desires. That's a fancy word. Conspicuous. So again, let's don't do that because many people are still doing that today. Oh, yeah. They're giving up knowing, really knowing God for carnal desires. They, they come to churches and we did too. And we wanted healings. We wanted financial miracles. We wanted position. There's all kinds of stuff we wanted. And yet we really didn't realize how much we needed to know our Father. If we're in union with somebody, we need to know them. We need to get close to them. And so we want to keep our conscious awareness on the voice of the truth. And the voice of truth speaking to our thoughts. We want... Jesus, if Jesus were to be here today and come into our presence and get to know us, I, I'd love to hear him say, I've never seen such great confidence. Because that's what we need, is confidence. Confidence in the Father. Whatever you put your confidence in, that's what you go after. And again, if your confidence is in, in the systems of this earth, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be under control. And we don't want that. Amen? So again, uh, if you want to, I, in the beginning of this video, I told about how I found out on uh, BibleSoft that you can download the free program now. It's like a 300 something dollar program. That's what it, that it cost somebody that bought it for me back in 1996. It may be higher than that, but you can download their basic program, which is all you need. It has the strong uh, interlinear in it that I believe shows the the uh, 999 numbers that were, were added, numbers that were added. It has, uh, it has the Thayer's interlinear. It has five versions of the Bible, and I use the King James so I can translate from it. It's a wonderful program. You can download it free. So go to my Facebook page. The link is there. I've shared it on most of the groups, groups that I'm under. Robin, you'll be excited about that. And then also, uh, we're doing a Zoom. Robin, me and Cecil are sponsoring a Zoom meeting Thursday night at 5 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to be teaching out of my book, Simple Answers, What Seem to Be Difficult Questions, because a lot of people still have these questions and they need to be answered. And you can see our last Zoom meeting from last week. We talked about why, uh, whether there needed to be a virgin birth, 
We talked about the word begotten. It's on my Facebook. You can watch that. But if you want to be on the Zoom meeting, I need to, I'll need to send you a password and a code to that. And we'd like to know you're going to be there. Make sure and download the program. Make sure your camera's working. Make sure you have a headphone set or earbuds to listen with because if you use the speaker on your camera, it'll get feedback. Make sure your camera's above you so we're not looking up your nose like I tell people. You want to kind of look what you look like on those. And then uh, either uh, message me on Messenger, uh, your email address, or send me an email at Dr. Roy, e Dr. Roy, middle initial E, Richmond at Cox.net, and we will send you the link to that. So we appreciate you've been here. It's always a blessing to be able to share the truthful word with people around the world. We've connected with two brothers in Ireland now, which is very exciting. I've been talking to one of them on Messenger, and a gentleman from South Africa is going to call me today at 1.30. So we're beginning to connect with a lot, a lot of different people. So it will be at 5 p.m. Central Time is when we do it, 5 p.m. Central Time in the United States of America. Last week, some people in Africa tried to get on about 4 but it's 5 p.m. Central Time. I think it's Central Standard Time here. So we love you guys. Bless you. Appreciate you being here.